what you just described then is what we did in that refinancing consolidation period. So that was a big part of it. So when I say refinance, so we had to do every loan, all of them. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know if you ever played that game like uh, Jenga, where you stack the blocks. It's like you pull one out before you can pull the next out. Like, it's not like you can just go to the bank and say, I want to refinance all of these other ones. Like you have to do two and then when after those ones are done, then you can do another one. And it's like, it's a longer process than I anticipated. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Dashdot Insider, the auditory epicenter for property investors seeking a life of freedom, choice and abundance. And on today's episode, we have a returning guest, Charlie Vella. Charlie has been on the show many, many times. We've talked about all kinds of different stuff, property investing for business owners, all kinds. Um, but what's really interesting is this time we talked about his portfolio and there's only been one other episode where we've talked about his portfolio and his journey. That was a few years ago where he talked about how he and his wife built their portfolio, I think to, at that point in time, 10 properties. Um, it was a really interesting episode because a lot of people um, really struggled to believe that it was true. And so what we actually did in this episode is we reflected on that journey um, at, up to that point and then what's happened since in the portfolio and then where he's going next and how building a portfolio that's been able to give him financial independence has changed his life. So it's a really interesting episode, particularly for anyone who's at any stage of the journey. If you're early on and you're wondering what's possible, this is going to be great for you. If you're halfway through and you're like, oh man, it feels like I'm never going to get there. This is going to be great for you. If you are later in the journey, you're going to be among the rarefied few that is going to be looking for other examples of other people like you, and you're going to enjoy this too. So I do believe this is an episode that is going to serve a lot of people, a lot of great insights and advice there. Um, we looked at what Charlie could have done differently if he could go back. If he could go back. So there's lots of lessons learned and all of that kind of stuff as well. So packed full of excellent advice, great insights, and lots of words of, words of wisdom and encouragement. So without any further ado, let's get stuck right into it. I will see you on the inside. Hey guys, welcome back to Dash Talk Insider. Joining me today is a cereal guest, and I don't mean of the breakfast cereal type. Charlie Vella, welcome back to Dash Talk Insider. How are you? Chris, I'm really well, and thank you for having me on again. I was ref reflectively looking at this, and we haven't done a podcast in quite a while, and a ton has happened. A ton has happened. Now, I well, we have done a couple. Of, I've done a couple of podcasts on your podcast, which have been very fun, um, and they've all, all been very good. But the interesting thing is, we've done multiple podcasts on Dashdot Insider previously. The Investor Lab. You've been a free, you've been a frequent guest on here, but there's only been a couple, maybe only one other one, where we specifically looked at your portfolio, where we actually said, hey. Let's talk. I think Bianca was on that episode as well. And we were just reflecting on that. It might have been a couple of years ago now. So, so much has changed. How's this though? I still get people messaging me asking, is it real? Still. Mm. And they see the, and they go, is it real? Did it happen? And I'm, of course, verifying that. But I'm still fascinated that the popularity of that episode got. And thank you to everyone that did reach out. Yeah, that's awesome. And kind of part of the reason I wanted to get you on here, right? Because you know, in the spectrum of investors we've had at Dashdot, you are in the kind of upper category of people who've been able to buy a significant amount of properties, right? And so what I actually thought would be really useful is kind of a reflection on the journey, because when we did that, the previous podcast, with, uh, which we'll link in the show notes, if anyone wants to check that out, that was a couple of years ago, but that wasn't even at the start of the journey. We were already, you know, I think four properties in at that point or something like that, if, if my memory serves me correctly. And what was really interesting is you started your journey with us. You already had a, a property, you know, that was split into two prior. Uh, you started that during COVID, which was a time when a lot of people were not investing. Yet you started investing at that time. Then we sort of had this kind of check-in point about a year later, and it's now been a couple of years since then. And so I really want to just let's walk through that journey high level. We don't need to spend the spend twenty minutes going through the the whole chronology of it. But I'm very interested to kind of discuss how your strategy might have changed or what your portfolio looks like now. So what could, let's go back a little bit. What made you kind of start investing during COVID and how do you feel about the decision now? Yeah, that's a great question to lead this one off. And I think I had a factor other people didn't have, and that's that Bianca was pregnant. So a Jack had arrived at this point, but that was actually the trigger. So when we first uh, got together, I think when Bianca and I were 20, that was my uh, signal in life to, hey, like maybe get a career, like you've got to be able to provide. And then something happened again when uh, Bianca became pregnant as I started thinking about, well, I've got a child to look after now. The idea of just, you know, living, I won't say week to week because I wasn't living week to week, but the idea of living to my own means had shifted to going, well, I've got a family now. And it created something in me where I felt like compelled no one was forcing me to do it, 
no one was like there wasn't a parent going you should get property you should do this like it came from within and i don't even know where from we'll call it the universe <laughs> but i was very very motivated now uh, I looked at this and got, I'm very motivated. And then this COVID thing had happened. And I'd also like always been a huge fan of Warren Buffett. And he's saying that, you know, when, uh, what is it? When people are being fearful, you should be greedy. And then when everyone's being greedy, you should be fearful. And I looked around and I said, this is the time when everyone's being fearful. And I took it as this is my opportunity. Like things come up in life where it's like, you get a swing at the plate. And I looked at it and COVID was happening and I'm like, well, if the world ends, uh, we're all screwed anyway. But if it doesn't, there's a chance for me to do really well in property here. So I took it and I went particularly hard. And what's interesting is on the back of that wave is when I did the least, we were consolidating and refinancing and renovating and kind of spending more time looking after our portfolio when that shift had happened. But I'd always liked the idea of being a little bit more contrarian, and I would put that down to probably why I have gotten results that I've, others have not, is because that's kind of how I've run my life in general. Mm, that's super interesting. Yeah, particularly the fact that uh, when everybody else sort of was jumping into the market, so we'll call that sort of 2021, that was actually the time that you consolidated a little bit. So on that, it's kind of like the that actually the opposite, right? So. How to give us the kind of high level summary in that kind of first year of really pushing hard. What did you what did you manage to accumulate in your portfolio at that point? Because that's a reference point that a lot of people have that we want to go, okay, what, what was that like? Then I'd like to know, we use the use 2021 as the kind of barrier. What happened what did, what happened about you what changed in your portfolio since then? And then I want to talk about how your point of view is on investing at the moment. So 2020 through 2021, 2021 to now, do you want to give us an understanding of how the portfolio looks in those phases? Phases. Okay. So notably, this does include the PPR I bought when I was like 20, but we did get to the 10 properties. So we had the 10. So we went from 10 and then in a space of like two and a half years with help from yourself, um, we got to the 10. Like we went uh, particularly hard, maybe a little bit too fast, but at the same time, I do think at times I was particularly, how can I put this, is we would buy a property in a different state thinking it would be the same as another state. And then that would cause unnecessary pressure and stress because now we've got to get a, a what is it, justice of the peace. I'm suddenly in some random's house before a cutoff at a deadline. This guy used to be a cop, was the justice of the peace of the area. It just felt a bit weird. So I look at that and go, while I was up for that, I look back on it and go, was that really good investing? Or was that like a bit sporadic? Was I going a little bit too fast? And I go, a little bit more research wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world, but I probably wouldn't change anything because of the outcomes. But there, I guess there was a little bit of responsibility that could be taken there. So that's one side of it. But on the other side, I look at it and go, the opportunities that were in that time needed to be seized. So or in my opinion, needed to be seized. They didn't need it to be, but I yeah. wanted you to ensure you, that. You chose that you wanted to seize those opportunities. Correct. And the risk that come with it. So that was, again, a really phenomenal thing. So we got to the 10 properties. And I think roughly just um, because, you know, times change and so do valuations, it was like we had over 5 million in property at this point. Yeah. So you had over 5 million in property and that's great and that's excellent. But what was really interesting about your portfolio is the cash flow. So a lot of people have kind of seen, we've used your case study quite a lot because quite frankly, um, you've had really great results. So, you know, why wouldn't we want to share those with the world? But a lot of the properties you've bought have been significantly cash flow positive. Now, obviously, cash flow is going to be dictated by loan conditions and all of that kind of stuff. But thinking about profit, so profit including principal repayments, at the maximal profit spectrum, like when you were getting the most amount of profit out of the portfolio, ostensibly probably when interest rates were the lowest, how much profit, profit were you pulling out of your portfolio at any given point in time, including principal payments? Yeah, so I'll put some caveats around this because I caught some heat about this from your audience, particularly in my lack of use of equity. <laughs> so I will I will put this here. Um, for every property we have bought, we have uh, put down a 20% deposit. We have contributed uh, income from business and put that down and not you know, extracted the maximum equity into the next. So, so that from is genuine savings. So just to be clear, so what you're saying is genuine savings from external sources have formed your deposits for your properties. Correct. So in the nature of that, if I was ripping all the equity out of every property to buy the next one, the cash flow would have been different. So, and I have my reasons for that, and I'm happy to go into that if you'd like, but I'll stick to this question for now. In the nature of that, every property we did with you, um, because we bought a lot during that COVID time before rents really like took off, had this phenomenal like knock-on effect where 
not only did we get good capital growth, but we got really good rental growth that came with it. Now, at the peak, so when interest rates were at their lowest um, and rents started climbing up, the portfolio was profiting. It was over $8,000 a month. Like it was significant, um, which is huge. You think about that, like, is that it's got to be close to a hundred grand, like 94? 1,333 would be, would be, you know, would be a hundred grand. So, yeah. So we, we, um, we were, la- we we're not laughing, but we were like laughing in shock because we we're like, this is like an income we used to earn, right? Like, I, I, for my age, you know, go back in time a little bit to when I was like 20, or Bianca was working as an accountant, like 80 grand a year as an accountant was a good wage. So we were like uh, blown away with that type of experience. Yeah. Now it's interesting as well, like looking at the the, the makeup of that. Now you, you and I have a, a shared understanding, which I think is the correct understanding around profit and versus cash flow in a portfolio. And when someone's making principal payments, they, it, that still contributes to the profit side of the equation. So not all of that was cash flow, but it was profit. Now, if you had had all of your loans, correct me if I'm wrong, by the way, I'm, this statement I'm making is, is there to be uh, pressure tested. But if the loans had all been on interest only, that would have been all cash flow. Is that kind of like the right way to think about that? Yeah. So if everything was on interest only and we didn't pay any principal down, that's how it would be. In my case, I elected because we didn't need uh, cash for things at that time that I wanted to have my loans on principal and interest because I could get an even lower interest rate. So just selectively in my circumstance here, my view was that, well, and the difference was like a percent, right? It wasn't small. So if we were going to have loan structuring for us, and let's say the rate was like 4%, we could get 3% if we were willing to put it on uh, principal and interest. I elected to go that route. And then my kind of plan was that I was going to leave it like that and then refinance maybe five years down the road to a new longer term 30-year loan, like extend the length of the loan, keep the principal in the property. And then that would create a bigger cash flow spread so that we started like pulling some out and paying some down and maybe just repeat that as a refinancing strategy every five years. Now, obviously not financial advice, that's just was my debt retirement strategy. I was wanting to play it. Like I've, I'm very fortunate and lucky that you know business has done pretty well also. So I haven't been in a position where I've like needed cash and had to have things on interest only. But that's just personally how I like to play. It. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And so that was it's really interesting because that kind of number, the numbers you're talking there, you're sort of talking 80, 90, close to 100 grand in profit in your portfolio. That's what a lot of people seek in a sort of 10 year time horizon. Now you obviously had the the advantage of having a business that could support the growth of your portfolio, which was useful, but it's pretty good that you did that in what a couple of years, right? Yeah, for, I think phenomenal. Like I'm incredibly grateful and the performance of the properties has been uh, exceptional here. Like I've what we've seen within the portfolio has been magic, like really has. And I'm, I, it's not a day goes by that I think what would have happened if I didn't necessarily seize the opportunities that came up. Super interesting. What does the portfolio look like now? Have you still got 10 properties? Have you got more than 10 properties? How has the last kind of 12 months or 18 months, you know, since interest rates have started rising, how has that changed your portfolio or how are you thinking about your portfolio now? I love this question because this is what no one tells you, right? You ready for this? You get to this point where um, maybe you've maxed out your borrowing or maybe um, you're in this consolidation. Now, in our, uh, our setup, we'd taken on a couple of loans that we didn't like the structuring of. We'd also like, maybe we could, we wanted to buy a property. There was only one bank that would give us lending at the time and it wasn't on great terms. We would buy the property and then the plan was to, we'll refinance at another point, right? So when we got to the 10, we're like, this is amazing. We've reached a point where things are really good. We want to consolidate, let a run through of rent rises go through. We also had some like maintenance issues we wanted to clean up. We had some loans we wanted to clean up. And we actually wanted to do some renovations to increase rents uh, further. Now, I, and maybe someone had told me and I wasn't paying attention, but this consolidation period is actually really important because one year of compounding on the portfolio, one year of getting rent raises up, doing kitchens and all those things. On the back of that, getting valuations done and getting your borrowing power done again really can make a massive difference. So we put particular attention on uh, that because between the loan structuring and all the rest, we're able to increase the profits further. So there was a, a bigger profit that was kind of formed out of that that was great. Just uh, so happened that a few interest rate rises also started to creep in at a point which kind of diminished some of that. But at the same time, we were able to absorb interest rate rises incredibly well which is, again, something I think was uh, a, a 
good move on our part, I do. Why were you able to absorb the interest rate rises so well? Because you mentioned just before we jumped on that your uh, portfolio currently is still positively geared, which a lot of people would be very uh, envious of. Was it because you bought at the right time and enough time has passed and rents have gone up? Is it because you've renovated properties to specifically increase rents and yields? Or is it because you've managed your LVRs in such a way that you just don't have too much debt on the port? What is, what, what is kind of like for you been the biggest driver towards the kind of current cash flow status of your portfolio? I'd have to say all of it. Because uh, as I used in the example before, if you've got a portfolio of, of five million, and by restructuring your loans, you can get your interest rate down one percent, right? That's such a significant amount of interest per year. Like it really starts to add up in that way. Like one percent is fifty grand, right? That's a that's a significant thing. And it's like if you could get a fifty grand a year saving just on restructuring, and making sure you're with lenders and favorable terms, like that can work incredibly well for you. So like that's one of the things we did and were able to absorb interest rate rises through that. The second one was rents going up. And I couldn't sit here and say that isn't a massive factor. Like across the last couple of years, it's easy. In some of the properties, the rent went up uh, like across a two-year period, like 25 to 30%. Like it was significant. Others, not so much. Like not all of them did to that level. But as a whole over the portfolio, it's been over 10% per year. And we're still getting um, good rental rises, which has been significant. So those two would be the biggest factors uh, significantly. But then the other side of that is when we've done renovations or made properties better, they've been able to increase rents as well, which has been really nice. Nice. And so reflecting back on the last few years of building this portfolio, what have, what have been some of the biggest mistakes that you made that if you could go back, you would you know do things a little bit differently? Yeah, that's a great question as well. I'll... Um, I'll preface this as well because we're going to come back because we did actually sell a property. I do want to say you said what did the portfolio look like? We'll cover. We'll come back and come back around. Um, one of the things I didn't appreciate at the time was just loan structuring and the effects of borrowing power. So I'm really happy with the assets that we bought. Like I wouldn't actually go back and say no to any of them because they've performed. They've done as they expected. I like the areas. I'm comfortable with what's come into it. But one of the mistakes I made is one of the properties, which we'll talk about, I won't reveal you know, any secret source of where it is or anything, Goose. That's yours to disclose at your discretion. Well, if you bought it more than a couple of years ago, I think we're okay. But, you know. Okay. Well, I'll say this is in a, uh, it's, n- I'll say it's in New South Wales and it's not <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> you can give away more of that than you want. But we recently actually sold uh, that property and it won because it's done really well. Like it's had a significant uplift over the last few years and there was a good amount of profit to take. But two, because I bought it in a structure that wasn't necessarily um, great for future borrowing, it was actually hampering f- future borrowing capacity. So to sell that, take the win, and then redeploy capital elsewhere actually turned out to be really advantageous. Now, this wasn't a part of my goals or things I was looking at. I was more trying to buy like long-term hold properties. But when we looked at that and then some of the, I'll just call it like wizardry you guys have with your property um, forecasting. I don't know what if I call it that. The, the, um, the price and rent forecasting models that we've built. That one. Yep. Yeah. So when we looked at that, it appears there's better opportunities from that capital over the next few years than we're currently in. So the decision to sell that property. Now, if I hadn't bought that in that structure, I wouldn't have sold it. Mm. But what it was just so- structure? What do you mean by structure? Like, do you mean like the ownership structure or do you mean the borrowing structure? So we uh, bought the first run of properties all in our personal name. And we had loaded up on an amount of debt in our personal name where that was then becoming the enhampering on future borrowing. Where if we had bought that one in a trust- um, again, please seek out your own uh, advisory on this. I'm not going to pretend I know trusts and everything else. But from a borrowing perspective, the inability to isolate that debt had meant that we were going to be limited on moves we could pull down the road. And there's some big moves I want to pull down the road, Goose. I'll, I'll preface I'm that very, I'm very keen to talk about that in a second. But noting that none of this is financial advice and everything is um, – you know, just unique to, it's just opinions and, and all of that kind of stuff. I'm super interested around the structuring thing. Do you think if you could go back to the start, would you have bought any in your personal name or would you have just gone, I'm only going to buy in trusts because, you know, that's going to give me advantageous, um, you know, opportunities down the line? Because you bought a few in your personal name. It wasn't just this one. Yeah. I, if I could go back in time, I still would have bought some in my personal name, but I would have been much more strategic on which ones. And the obvious example is like, if you're going to buy a property, like we did a, a development that's a more growthy property, it doesn't have great cash flow on it. 
but we want to hold it. It's like that's great in your personal name because you can negative gear. Right now, I'm not a fan of negative gearing overall in the overall mix of a portfolio. But if you've got a wide variety of por- uh, properties in your portfolio, I'm down with negative gearing something in your personal name and then putting more capital in something that's in a trust, which is more cash flow heavy or being a bit more selective on where you use your capital to uh, find an optimum tax structure. So I think that's where the advantages are. There's also some like funky rules out there, and I won't pretend that I understand it all, but like in some cases, I've found people that buy properties in companies for very strategic reasons uh, because they have plans to like sell it and roll money into other things. Right. So like again, I was naive and hungry for the opportunity that wasn't, and I was just getting after it with what we've learned down the road is like I think there is room for strategy around what structures people buy in, particularly depending on what their own income situation is. Or what their setup is, a hundred percent. And you know, and just for from a point of interest, like another thing you can think about doing when you've got these multiple structures, because you can claim tax benefits in your personal name, but you don't want to have any losses in a trust because you can't roll those, you can't claim any of the losses right in the trust. They, you, you, you're not going to get the same negative gearing benefits. But you can refinance equity out of a, a property that's owned in your personal name because then you can claim that loss against your personal income. Then you can move that equity into a property that's in a trust to offset any kind of like negative cash flow in that portfolio, in that property or that trust. And you can kind of like move things around that way. So it gives you a lot of benefits if you if you get to understand how to use different structures to your advantage. Of course, go and speak to an accountant and get your own advice on that because everyone's situation is completely unique. But there can be some real advantages of actually getting really strategic about this early on as well. Completely. And what you just described then is what we did in that refinancing consolidation period. So that was a big part of it. So when I say refinance, so we had to do every loan, all of them. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know if you ever played that game like uh, Jenga, where you stack the blocks. It's like you pull one out before you can pull the next out. Like, it's not like you can just go to the bank and say, I want to refinance all of these other ones. Like you have to do two and then when after those ones are done, then you can do another one. And it's like, it's a longer process than I anticipated. So, super interesting. So, aside from aside from that, um, are there any other mistakes that you that you that you made that you wish you could have avoided? They would they would be my big ones. They they are the ones I look at. I I must say again, it's like I feel very fortunate that we haven't had a huge amount of setbacks in the portfolio, and it's performed strongly even in what I would call interesting times overall. And I would put that down to like buying well has been a huge part of that and getting advice, right? The thing that I'm not sitting here is like, I didn't pick properties on realestate.com or anything, or just randomly buy things. Like I've always been of the view is like, I'm, I'm very good at what I do as a profession. And I go, I'm sure there's people out there like that in the property world. It's like, it'd be madness for me to try and pretend that I can buy or pick areas or things like they can. I just don't believe it. Yeah, yeah, totally. So you mentioned that you sold a property. So what does your portfolio look like now? Yeah. So we actually bought a property, then sold a property. So we went from 10 to 11. And then we've gone back to 10 uh, very strategically because of that. And um, the reason why is that on the back of uh, interest rates going up, I kind of started to get the same inkling that a lot of people are going to pull back. Like I actually felt that as interest rates rise, a lot of buyers are going to get nervous. A lot of investors are going to get nervous. We're potentially going to see some really great opportunities. And um, my incl- I don't know if my inkling is correct yet. It probably hasn't been long enough to know. It's only a, a recent more recent purchase that's come through, but I looked at it and go, well, this is, while I admit not as extreme as the pandemic and COVID, this is a time when a lot of investors are limited. If there's people that want to sell, is there's the potential to be someone who can uh, take advantage of those situations. So we acquired another property and this one's a bit different. This one, um, I got the idea as interest rates go up, everyone's going to be looking for cash flow because that's what they're going to be looking for. And the opportunities are actually going to exist in growth. Because the idea of buying a property with a lower yield in a time like this will seem like madness to everyone else. That's what I'm after. I'm after a bit of madness. Uh, That's a key. And uh, Grant, who's been on the podcast, um, he he says um, uh, he often refers to me as a bit of a vulture. He's like, you've got that mentality at times. And I'm like, oh, kind of wear that. (laughs) But um, as a compliment. Yeah, it was. I think it was meant that way. Maybe. Hope so. Yeah. Um, But that's where we looked at that. So we actually really spiced this one up even further and we went something that's a bit of a development site. So we've got something where there's an existing dwelling on it. I think you'd call it like a backyard subdivision or a splitter in those that's the develop, developer terms. Splitter. Yeah. Yeah, they love it. Um, I just needed an AMG 63 
and a pair of Timberland boots, and I'll be one of them. <laughs> uh, be careful, be careful. So, um, what's the what's the yield on that one? Yeah, so the um, this is, and again, I'll just give region it's in WA. Um, now, the existing yield is six percent, right? So, the idea of buying something that is a already assessed splitter, we can get a six percent yield on it. It's in a good growth location. My ploy with this one is a little bit different to other properties where I've intended to go, hey, I'm going to buy this thing. And this is actually more like I would consider this a flip or a trade where this isn't something I'm actually intending to hold for the long term, open-minded to changing on that. But this is something where I've seen the ability or the ability to use capital, hold for a good run here and then sell for a profit. And um, what's kind of like opened my eyes up to this a little bit is the actual other property we sold is because this wasn't intended as a flip or a trade. But we bought that, held it for about two and a half years. Yes, we um, it was positive gear the whole time we had it, so it paid us while we held it. We did do some renovations when we sold, but like the gain on that property over a three year period was significant enough where I sit there and go, "This is like it's substantial." Which um, I'll, I'll share right now is like it, round, round numbers. It's like we ended up making close to two hundred thousand dollars on that property. Yeah, over uh, what period of time? Go, I think it's. Uh, one second. I'll, let's get let's get a little bit particular. I've got my spreadsheet here with some more details. You can see I'm a big picture guy, right? I just want to check the exact date. So I don't want to um, I don't want to uh, misrepresent what happened because I think at times in property, particularly, people get a bit excited, and I can get a bit excited. Um, so we bought that in the eighth month of twenty. So almost three years we had it. Two and a half years mm. is, is how long we had it. Yep. And so you bought that property roughly for for how much did you pay for it? Uh, six twenty. Six twenty, and sold it for uh eight twenty. Eight twenty. So that's pretty bloody good because two hundred grand. I mean, two hundred grand on a two million dollar property over a uh two year two year period. Two year period. Two and a half. Two and a half year period. That's that would be good. But two hundred grand on a six on a six hundred twenty thousand dollar property over a two and a half year period is excellent. You know, that's. That that's my thinking, and um, to share some more insight on that is like uh, we got paid a good profit, and I'm looking at the P and L in the in the peak of this when the rates were low. Like this property was spit, spitting out two grand a month of profit as well, right? So that was covering like stamp duty renovations. Like it was a it was a self sourcing pudding is the way I like to think of it. <laughs> nice, a hands free money maker. So. Um, how do you think about trading? Well, I'm interested to know like how your thoughts about strategy have evolved, and I want to particularly pick up on this this trading kind of idea because how do you rationalise the idea? And I'm sure that you're not moving to a state where you just want to you know trade buy and sell properties and flip properties willy nilly, or maybe you are. But I'd be interested to know how your thinking has evolved around the idea of selling properties because when we started, it was all about accumulation. Now you've sold a property. And also the newest property that you've bought, you've bought it, and even though you may change your mind, with a view that it may be a property that you sell. So a lot of investors have a fear of selling. They're like, oh, you should never sell a property. You'll pay capital gains tax, blah, blah, blah. You should just never do it. And there's this kind of big idea that you should only ever hold properties. But I'd be interested to know your thoughts around how trading might actually play a role in an overall strategy to be advantageous, not something to be afraid of. Yeah, I love this question. This is something I've spent so many hours thinking about here. And um, the, the way I think about it, um, and I've borrowed this term from the share investing world, is like I start to think about this more as a portfolio. So they have this thing called like satellite and core, which is like for a lot of investors who are in that world, they'll have like some you know robust ETFs that are really boring. But then on the other, and then with a portion of their uh, portfolio is that they're like speculating on mining companies. But they think it's okay as long as they're not necessarily like 100% speculating on mining companies. So my view is that um, I really like having a core. Like I've got a strong core of properties that is designed around like long-term hold. And that is a strong percentage of the portfolio. But I do see there's these opportunities around the fringes that come up that don't fit that part of the core. But I think there's room for them because overall the risk isn't significantly higher across everything in in my opinion and for me i'm not suggesting this is for everyone would i um necessarily just do property flips it's probably it's probably not my style like it's you would want to be like that's your profession if you did that but i think it has a place for people who get to a point where they can have some like it's uh it's dangerously a little bit of fun for us as well like even last night bianca and i were watching like uh, uh what is it is it terry Ryder? 
like webinar, like, like property is a hobby for us. We're enthusiasts, right? We're watching it. We're like, oh, go Melbourne. You know, like it's it's what you do. So It's interesting you said um, you get to a point because right? I actually remember, so what you're talking about is modern portfolio theory, which is something I'm really, really passionate about. And modern portfolio theory um, dictates that you the optimal portfolio has a diverse range of assets that have a variety of different risk, risk, and, risk and reward profiles that should all be balanced in such a way that you find an optimal risk-free rate of return, sort of kind of that's the general context which is effectively what you're talking about. You want to have some assets that are, you know, solid and safe, but you can then you can actually get better returns out of your portfolio by taking some calculated kind of bets for lack of a better, for lack of a better term. Um, but it's interesting you talk about like reaching a point in your portfolio where that makes sense. Because I actually remember talking to you a couple of years ago when, you know, you'd ostensibly achieved a lot and you're like, what, 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 what do we do now? And I was like, well, now you're sort of, you're at a point now where you don't have to do anything else. So if you want to do stuff now, you can do it for fun. Like, like, do you want to speculate a little bit on a smaller town area? Do you want to like, you actually get to do things because you're like, okay, that seems interesting because you built that ba that base, that foundation, the core, as you called it. I'm interested in your point of view. And when do you think, like if someone's thinking about their own portfolio, at, and this is not, you know, dictative at, no, at I'm, all. I'm ready to give advice on this one. Okay, I'm all ready right, to cool. me right. up. At, all right. at, okay. what, at what point do you think it is appropriate for people to start thinking in that way where they're like, oh, I'm going to start taking some calculated bets? Or when do you think it's inappropriate? Okay, so this, this is how I came up with it for me. Other people can assess. Is like I got to a point where I got $5 million in property, right? And then I looked at it and go, if property does 5% a year from here, right, just 5%. Mm. which is below the averages and it's not including what comes from cash flow. Like if it just does 5% a year, that's 250 grand a year. I'm like, I don't live on 250 grand a year, but I live substantially below 250 grand a year. Although we can talk about some of what, we'll, actually we'll get to the wildness of my life now, which is so much fun. Hint, hint, what's in the background. <laughs> um, but the, the point being is I'd gotten to a place where essentially I'm financially independent. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm not actually relying on anything from here. Just got to look after the current um, type of things. I think everyone should hit that first. I really do. And then that way, it's kind of like, okay, well, if you are going to take something that's more speculative or risk and it doesn't come off, like you're still okay. Because at the end of the day, it's like we recognize it's both entertainment um, because it is a fun thing for us, but also that is an investing thing. So I like that. And I, I think that's an appropriate way to do it for someone that has a risk profile like me. But other factors aside, I would never directly advise someone copy that without getting advice. Mm. But that's what made it excitable where I'm, I'm willing to take more risk. But I'll throw in some other things as well. So we've got that one side of it. The other side of it is I'm actually still building my core, but it's been through uh, super. Like I got to the point where I'd neglected my super for many years. I still think the government's trying to rip me off with it in some way, but we'll leave that. We'll I'm leave that out. Of this I'm not a fan of super. I'm not a fan of super. I, I, the tax setup really enticing, mm. but at the same time, to an entrepreneur, I look at even with those tax incentives, capital in the hand is just so much more valuable to me. Hundred than... percent. I'm like, don't no. I'm like, I, I, I would choose to not participate <laughs> personally. If there was some sort some of opt people, out. It's good. Yeah, but totally. So in my case here again, I'm still running a business. I've still got an income. It's very tax advantageous for me. So I look at Super and I have elected to build out more of my core in Super. And then I'm also building out some core um, like to that. Like I'm not done with the core. We're going to do it. But it's more like this modern portfolio theory where it's like we're just balancing it out and keeping the different sectors in check. Mm. I like that. I like that. Um, but I did cut you off a little bit around, around that. Do you want to talk about your portf Do you want to talk about where you want to, where you want to go with your portfolio? Yeah, we can, we can go there, but I want to throw in one more element first. Okay, go for it. So um, so we got to this point from here, and I think for a lot of people, it's like um, the idea of getting to financial independence and getting to a point like mine is huge and takes years and it's a big amount of effort. But when you get there, one of the things I've noticed is we weren't really living it. And um, I shared this story before because we'd, we'd had kids and all the rest, but um, at Bianca's birthday dinner, um, she actually pulled me up and aside and said, like, well, when are we actually going to start living our dreams and this lifestyle we want to have? So one of the elements we've really introduced as well that is now that we've hit this point is like actually spending more on living. So um, right now I'm very fortunate. If anyone watching the video, they'll see the the background here is like, we don't live in a house anymore. We're living in a premium inner Melbourne city apartment with all the facilities. Everything they tell you is a reason not to buy an apartment because it's a bad investment. I'm in here loving at the moment. 
We are renting it. We are definitely renting it. But um, it's like I'm getting to enjoy some more life experiences as well. And I I really want to encourage anyone who gets to a point like mine, like the idea isn't just endless accumulation. It's the idea that we get to enjoy life on a really different level. And I'm I'm thrilled that um I've been able to experience that. Now I'm I'm not done, is the thing. I realize that it's like I I'm enjoying the process of building wealth and businesses and doing property stuff so much. I don't want to stop doing it. It's just something that's shifting more into an enjoyment and hobby part of our life rather than something I feel compelled to do so my family will be safe, which to be clear, I did feel that way at one point. Yeah, this, it's super interesting though, like because you know, in doing the thing that you love, you've created the life that you love. Right, so you you were in business. I mean, as you mentioned, there's an element of you. There's an element of drive. Like you've got to be the protector and all of that kind of stuff. But you do business because you enjoy business. You invest in real estate because you enjoy investing in real estate. And now you're at a point where you don't need to do either of those things. So you get to do those things, which is a very interesting uh, way to to live. So, yeah, do you have any advice for people who are who are on the journey and just sort of can't see it in front of them, like where they're just like, it seems like it's so far away. Because most property investors never get past their first property. They give up or they get stuck. So what advice would you, would you have to someone? Obviously, it sounds good, but what advice would you to give to someone who's earlier in the journey? That's another great question there. And I, I'd frame it this way. It's worth it. Like it, what you imagine it's going to be, it is. Like it is that you sleep different at night. So I'm not going to say it's easy. But um, rarely is anything easy truly worth doing. Uh, the journey of what you become and the skills you acquire and the person you become is worth it. Like the prize at the end is worth it. So if anything, I would be encouraging of people like, again, this is just my opinion, but I'm like, work the extra hours, get the extra job, cut your expenses, do the thing to get to this place because life is incredibly different and special once you do. And it's not that you're going to stop doing things after it, but I think it it's like it's changed me as a person. It really has. And I've had that feedback from many. How has it like, changed you? I live more in the moment now. It's less about sacrifice for a day that is someday down the road. I think I'm probably a lot calmer now as well. I will say children will have that effect on you as well, right? They'll, they'll certainly test your patience. <laughs> but um, I, I think that my views on the world and like how I show up is completely different also. So absolutely, I can see that that would be a, a different version of me exists. Yeah, it's fascinating though, because the, the friction that is required to get there is going to be massive no matter what you do. Because even just in the, pro like anyone who's bought multiple properties, just the process of sorting out loans and paperwork and all of that kind of stuff can be enough to make, I, many times I've gone, oh my God, it's like almost not worth it. Just filling in all these forms is just like almost not worth buying a property. <laughs> like it's so annoying. It is so annoying. And you've got this huge amount of friction that you must pass through to get there. But if you can persist, so there's the friction of saving money. There's the friction of trying to work out how to maximize your value and earn more money. There's the friction of all of that kind of stuff. But even if you're doing that, there's plenty of people who are earning lots of money who aren't investing and aren't creating financial freedom. They might have a really high salary and they've got the opportunity to do it. But the friction, whether that be intellectual friction, emotional friction, or administrative friction, or you know, any of these kind of things to get moving in that direction is really, really high. And so you end up with a lot of people who, despite potentially having the opportunity to do it, i.e. financially, just never get past that friction point. I've been reflecting on that a little bit today that these these things in your life that have these very high barriers can actually lead to the greatest rewards. And in fact, to the degree now, when I find something that's hard, I'm like, oh, this is great because there's a moat, right? That actually means that if I can pass through this, there's going to be something on the other side, which is going to be significantly advantageous. What are your thoughts on that? I think that is an incredible mindset to foster. And um, I've thought about these too. I, I do wonder where this came from in me. And I, I think it's actually from sport as a kid, because I think, uh, very used to the idea of like, you're going to suffer for a season. Like when I used to uh, ride bikes pretty hard, I was like literally designed on how hard I could punish myself to win. And that, that was the thing that came into it. And I think that served me very well when it came into business. Because I'm like, all right, championships at the end, you're going to be working hard for this. And um, again, you can enjoy it. Like I think the idea of um, stuff happens and we assign a meaning to it. It didn't have to be as much suffering as I elected to give it. But at the same time, I enjoyed that lifestyle and way of being. So I think that mindset's incredibly powerful for people. 
if I could just share one more of it, one of the things I found uh, incredibly challenging is not just like you're talking about the admin, not just getting the loans, earning the income, because that's I actually think that stuff's actually relatively straightforward. Like it's hard, don't get me wrong. It's um it's definitely hard, but it's simple. It's the second guessing yourself along the way. It's the people that will uh you know throw shots at you in inadvertently like passing comments that you know property is not a good idea. We should be doing shares or maybe all blue chip or all developments or no, nah, you shouldn't be buying in Australia. And it's like it's continual, continual doubt that comes up along the journey of are you even doing the right thing that can be really challenging. So we ha- we definitely had our moments. Like we definitely did, but I'm thrilled we pushed through and we're here today. How did how did you manage through that? Like how did you manage to stay the course? Stubbornness, we go that. Did <laughs> <laughs> well, that think- work? I did, but at the end of the day, I I kept coming back to like this idea. And like you talked about, like the idea of selling a property. So when there's a general consentment of like, you know, I shouldn't sell a property, I'm like, how deeply have I actually gone into the maths on this to see if it's a good or bad idea? And for me, I I had this extensive body of proof. I'm like, well, what we're doing is working. Like the people that are making these comments or doing it, I'm not seeing better results or like their life isn't better than mine where I'm going, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. Like it's not like they were getting uh, substantially better returns with a strategy that was different, and they had a compelling case study for people like me who was doing something different. Where for myself, I'm like, I'm seeing this in works. So I'm like, checking the bank account. I'm like, cool, the rent's going in, getting the bank value wear out. They're saying the property's worth this. Like, I was able to build enough evidence and proof that what we were doing and the way we were approaching it was working for us, and that we should keep going. And the other side of that is going well. Um, if we are not in the right direction, do we have the time to recalibrate if things change? And I was like, yes, we absolutely do. So that kind of gave me a little boost of like swing for the fence because at least you'll have a crack at doing something special rather than ensuring mediocrity. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, challenging your assumptions, like questioning and challenging your assumptions, I think is key. I, I We all have assumptions. We all make assumptions like, nah, you can't do things like that or you shouldn't do that. But like really pressure testing those and going, ah, why do I have that belief or why, like, why, why, why have I decided that selling property is, is bad, that, that trading is a bad strategy? Because everyone tells me that you've got to pay CGT. It's like, yeah, but like, let's just test that out for a little bit. I, you know, I'm a big fan of both. I'm a big fan of buy and hold long term. And I'm also a big fan of buying at the start of a growth cycle and selling at the end of a growth cycle and repositioning your capital. But, and, and trading properties is just one example of challenging your assumptions. I think challenging your assumptions about everything in your life is really useful and will lead to the most significant growth in all areas. So whether it be growth in wealth, growth in you know personal happiness, growth in what, whatever metric you want to you use, it is the process of questioning your assumptions and actually going, is this true or is this true for me? I think is really, really useful. Thoughts? Once upon a time, the consensus was that margarine was good for you, right? Or once upon a time, it was like, don't eat fat, eat sugar. Like, you know, like how many times has the consensus been wrong? And uh, I, I just look at that and saying it's a, an amazing idea to be able to challenge consensus and really look at it. Again, not easy, but I think for a lot of people in your audience, they're probably already doing that to a degree. Otherwise, they wouldn't be listening to shows like this. 100%. 100%. So you mentioned earlier in the podcast, you've got big plans for your portfolio. What are these big plans? Yeah. So I'm kind of, I'm still expanding out. So the things that I'm looking at is um, I'm having a really good season in business. So we've built the property portfolio to a stage. I've been very focused on that. And I don't want to say at the expense of my business, but I would say that I wasn't pushing for growth in the business that I was because a lot of energy and resources were going into building this portfolio. Um, since then, we put a, a bit of shift in business again, which has been great. Um, we've seen um, some good growth, which I'm fantastically happy for. Mm. But that's also opened up new borrowing capacity and new new opportunities. So the next part of this is going like, I really want to do, and these are just like, you know, wish list items for me. I'm not putting that on anyone else, but it's like extensively, I want to go for the 10 mil now. Like this is something that is the scorecard we're looking at. And it's through a mix of like, I want to put a blue chip in there. I want to uh, be able to add something. With, well, I call it a little bit more spice, right? Mm. A little bit more flavor. Um, so I'll add something like that in. And then uh, probably even venture into something or maybe a commercial at some point or something like that. So I want to experience the realms of property because I think there's merit in in many of them. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Look, I think that there's loads of ways to be successful in real estate. And going back to modern portfolio theory, 
you know, understanding that, that there's a place in your portfolio for commercial, there's a place in your portfolio for blue chip, there's a place in your portfolio for a rooming house, there's a place in your portfolio for some, you know, kind of low yielding growth based asset in a, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I couldn't agree with you more. And it's interesting because we as a company are moving in that direction. We've, we've been always, you know, macro, mac, macro strategic, micro agnostic. So it's like, what is the, the primary object, objective that we're trying to help people do? That is to create freedom through property, right? So how to, how to help them build wealth avoid avoid failure find success to all that kind of stuff find the right property the right place right time that doesn't mean that you can't do you know have a property that's got negative cash flow if that's the right thing for the portfolio now for a lot of people for most of their portfolio that might not be the right thing to do but commercial has a place capital cities have a place regionals have a place apartments have a place they all have a place and i think actually strategically moving yourself through the all the stages of the portfolio like you have gives you the optionality to then find where to put those spices to really flavor the portfolio. So you actually get a portfolio that is not only interesting, but fun, but also, and also financially rewarding. Completely. I'll even share a little bit more here is like, I'm, I feel like apartments are hated enough where it's getting interesting for me. Again, everyone's hating them. Must be some opportunity there. Developing, like how many builders have gone bust? Like how many developers are struggling? I'm like, there's, I see the approvals are down. People are coming in. I suspect developing could have some opportunity. Like these are the types of things that occupy my mind. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with you. Charlie, is there anything else you want to share with the uh, listeners before we wrap things up? Get after it. Like, it's worth it. Like, this is the whole thing. I'm here to inspire more people to do the same. I think it's a, a phenomenal thing to have in your life. Awesome. Love it. Charlie, I always love hanging out with you. Always enjoy our conversations. This has been as fun as ever. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. My pleasure.